In just about three weeks and one day, summertime in the Northern Hemisphere officially comes to an end. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. However, today, the 7th of September in the year 2020, marks kind of the official end of summertime for many people. This is the last big time we get together to do something until, well, Thanksgiving. Welcome to Truth to Ponder. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. Today on this program, I'm going to do two different things. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about some of the things that I'm observing in our world today. And then I want to take a break from all the news and share some some end of summer, beginning of September memories with you. Even play some music maybe you haven't heard in quite a long time. And I hope that today we can just get away after I give you the update on news. We'll take some time and remember a simpler time and maybe for many of us a better time. We are still in the height and the hyperness of the coronavirus. There are so many things that don't seem right about this, and during this week after today, we are going to look at a few more things regarding this virus. It's not that I deny it. I know that if with some people, if you say anything about the coronavirus that minimizes it from being a super pandemic that's going to kill billions of people, you're immediately paid to some kind of conspiracy theorist. I pity the people that hang around radios all day DXing and looking for things to complain about. Oh, that nut job over there talking about, you know, a conspiracy or the New World Order or whatever. Maybe you need to get a life. Many of us do a broadcast like this for a purpose. Number one, to inform. Number two, to encourage. And today I'm trying to do a little bit of both on the program. This begins our second week of Truth to Ponder. And I want to remind you of how to get in contact with the program early on. A couple of people said you you didn't give the web page enough and I couldn't listen all the way through. So let me give you the web address and also a mailing address. Somebody asked if I had a mailing address. So I'm going to do both of those right now. First, the web page is Truth to Ponder, which is the word truth, the number two, and the word ponder. Dot com. That is truth to ponder. Dot com. If you choose to use regular conventional mail, you can mail it to me at Bob, last name Beerman, and that is B I E R M A N N. That's B as in boy, I E R M A N N. And the mailing address. Where we are right now in Georgia is 21 Berkshire, B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E, 21 Berkshire Lane, and the city is Sky Valley, two words, Sky Valley, the state, Georgia, and our zip code here is 30537, that's 305. Three seven, of course, in the USA. So once again, I'll give that address now and later in the program. The address is 21 Berkshire, B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E, Lane. And you have to add, by the way, I almost forgot, this is very important. After you put Berkshire Lane, add number 263. That's number 263. I try to explain why they need that up here, but they do here at our little mountain post office. That is 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263, Sky Valley, Georgia, 30537. I'll give that address toward the end of the program again. So today I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in the news, and then I want to just drift away into a different time and a different place And remember the Labor Days, the weekends, the parties of the past. 
and maybe bring back for some of you some good memories. There's no doubt we live in a very unique and very difficult time. And later this week, we're going to be spending more time understanding the dynamics of what's going on. I pity the people that just turn on the news, CNN or NBC, ABC, CBS, and just buy everything they're told, hook, line, and sinker. Because if you are intellectually honest, and many people are not, the goalposts have been changing literally every week or two, all the way back since the end of February. I remember what people were saying then. I can see the statistics of where we are today. There's some people out there that want this to be a killer virus because it'll change politics. And there's no doubt that this is a very dangerous infection and virus. But people need to understand a few medical things. Number one, a virus is not a living organism, which may come as a big shock to some of you, but a virus is not a living organism. If you don't believe me, look it up. A virus is essentially some DNA markers surrounded by a layer of fat and receptors to, in essence, invade a living cell and change its DNA structure. That's what a virus actually is. There's a lot about this particular virus I find rather fascinating. We've understood what a SARS virus is, S-A-R-S. That's a severe acute respiratory syndrome, and the COV stands for a COVID virus. We knew about these viruses for for a long time, even, even had an outbreak start that was contained from China, by the way, in 2003, 2004. This new novel virus is not so novel after all because it is so reminiscent and about 80% the same in its structure and the type of DNA markers that it has to the current SARS-CoV-2 virus. That's why it's called SARS-CoV-2. This is not this is not the first time So we really do understand more than I think people have been led to understand. We knew back in 2003, by 2005, when this thing had burned itself through, it was in a part of 2003 and 2004, kind of like this one. It started in China in 2019. That's why it's called COVID-19. And it worked its way through the next year and subsided that much we do know that is historical fact that's not any conjecture that's not some conspiracy theory that's nothing that's been invented by somebody with a website those are the facts from the who the center for disease control in atlanta it's all easy to find on their websites and also what they did in treating this virus and the things they discovered which suddenly are fake news today, at least to the tech tyrants at Google and Facebook and Twitter. We'll be talking about that, too, later this week. I don't want to spend too much time on the news today because we get beat up by it all the time. I just want to remind you that in this day and age, more than any other time in my lifetime, Digging deep for the truth is increasingly necessary. There are so many things that are happening that are out of character for the United States, out of character for Canada, based on its history, and even parts of Europe. The things we are doing in response to this virus are very scattered, deliberately so, I believe, very vague, and also at times very draconian, but not to everybody or everything. I'll give you just a couple of examples. California and other states are just as bad. Nevada did some of the same things. It's amazing how 
this virus apparently doesn't really bother anybody in a casino. Casino. I mean, you can go to Caesar's Palace, but you can't go to a Calvary church because somehow the virus is going to infect and hurt and kill more in a church environment. San Francisco, a Catholic archbishop to celebrate a major feast day back in uh, the latter part of August, had to do it outdoors and only was permitted 12 in attendance. Let me say that. This is San Francisco. It had to be conducted outdoors, very strict social distancing, like they're 8 and 10 feet apart or more, only 12 in attendance. Yet if you want to do a George Floyd protest, hey, hundreds are welcome, and nobody enforces anything. You go against what the government say, they will take your building, they will turn off your power, and we're beginning to understand for what. The numbers are being inflated. I don't care what anybody tells you. I worked in emergency management. I spent time on a payroll coming out of retirement. And the more that I got into the things that I was seeing working, the more doubtful I was about what they're saying. A lot of it just did not make any sense. It never added up. And if it doesn't add up, I'm sorry, but I'm the kind of an individual that comes out of a very pragmatic background. I am not taken to 90% of the conspiracy theories. If you're looking to me to say something negative about 5G, you're looking to the wrong person. I'll do a show on 5G and put away some of your fears about 5G because there's a tremendous amount of misinformation about 5G. So don't be suckered into some of these theories the truth is many conspiracy theories out there are based on some level of fact but sometimes the facts get distorted by enhancements what i want to do on this program over time is to kind of sift through the data and give you a better feel here are my predictions going forward we are going to allegedly see 400,000 people die of the coronavirus in the United States by the end of the year. That's that's going to be the new mantra, along with, if we all wear a face mask, we'll all be good. If we all put on a face covering, it's just going to magically disappear. And if we just stop going to church, and all, if we just go to Walmart, we're okay. If we go to the liquor store, it's okay. If we go to the abortion clinic, it's okay. But man, you can't go to a church. Those are super spreaders. You can't tell me there's not some either anger or amosity against Christians. Or it's by design. And will those 400,000 really be just random victims in their 20s and 30s that were wearing their face mask and their gloves in their car and the coronavirus chased them down and they were infected and and ended up on a ventilator and died. Even now, the statistics don't bear that kind of thinking out. I have known several people that have suffered this virus and one that allegedly may have died. The one that may have died has had advanced Alzheimer's for 10 years in a nursing home, wasting away. And nobody had seen him because you couldn't get into that nursing home because of the COVID-19 requirements. So nobody really knows. Was it truly COVID or did, did he just die? Because when you look at what the anticipated life expectancy for this individual was. Honestly, that distant part of the family has been rather surprised that he lived as long as he did. Before everything locked down in February, family didn't give him much time. He had wasted away, his mind gone, and having difficulty with everything. 
Next phase would be difficulty in even understanding how to swallow and feed yourself. But that's the one death within our group. And I, I know there's some out there. But even the CDC quietly let us all know, quietly, of course, that, well, you know, 94%, and they try to minimize this, and I, I mean the, the Facebook fact checkers or fact less checkers or Ministry of Truth experts try to diminish this, but in 94% of the cases, with an on average 2.6 other issues life-threatening going on, 94% of those that died had other major issues. Most are elderly. And so they said only about 6% can they figure actually died of COVID-19. And we don't understand why. We don't even understand what other conditions or what or how or lack of treatment, whatever the case may be in those approximately 10,000 then that are left. If you understand the coding of COVID-19 in a death certificate, it was changed on April the 4th. How do I know that? You can go to the CDC's website and find it for yourself like I did but also because I was working at that time in emergency management in trying to plan and deal with this pandemic. I saw the memo that explained how the coding now worked, and they were officially no longer counting flu deaths at that point. That was They were done counting those on April the 4th of this year. That is from the CDC. I would venture to say that some actual flu deaths were called COVID, even though there was no COVID present. We'll get into the facts on this, but I think that we need to have a better understanding that it's what Ron Emanuel said many years ago, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I see it being used for things that are blatantly un-American and blatantly treasonous. We'll talk about that this week later. Also, I'm going to be talking about where we're heading as a society how information, especially if you use social media and the big tech platforms, is going to be filtered, censored, or erased. And those that are Christians, I want you to be mindful because this is coming up later this week. We are going to have to develop our own platforms and media outlets to communicate among ourselves. And it's not going to be that difficult. It's not even that expensive. It just takes being wise. When you are dependent upon somebody else to get out your message, then that person can control your message. Let's just leave it at that for the time being. Let's get back to Labor Day. For most of us here in the United States... Back in my day, school started the Wednesday after Labor Day. Labor Day was always a Monday, the first Monday, first Monday in September. And on that Wednesday, all of us would go back to school. Now, in other parts of the country now, a lot of schools go back in like late July or sometime in August. It's it's very different. And most of us got out of school, at least back in my time, sometime in June though many schools today get out in May, so they've kind of moved things around a little bit. Right before the end of school, we had Memorial Day, kind of the unofficial beginning of summer. If you lived in New York State like I did, the water was still a little bit on the chilly side in Manhasset Bay or the Long Island Sound or even down at Jones Beach, and especially like Lake Ontario or any of the Finger Lakes, it was just downright cold but it was the first time for many that the barbecue grill came out first time you might consider wearing shorts because the weather's beginning to get a little bit warmer though it's still a tad cool at night especially in the northern half of the united states and you begin to look forward to summer if you came from where i lived 
in New York. Whether it's Long Island or upstate, upstate, of course, was worse. The entire wintertime was a cloudy affair. And it could be cold. It could be slushy. It could be icy. It could be snowy. It could just be downright miserable. And it can start as early as November and linger through December, January, February, and March. You can go four or five months with just awful weather. Then finally, as March gives way to April, and you start getting a few more sunny and warm days, and you no longer worry about things freezing at night, you begin to prepare for planting. You begin to get gardens ready at your house. You start getting things ready for cutting the grass, which is going to be coming by May. And you enjoy this time of coming out of the hibernation of winter. And you move into spring. Springtime can be chilly. It can be warm. But it seems by the time we got to Memorial Day, the weather was consistently relatively decent. A lot of rain in April and May. The old saying, April showers bring May flowers, is so true. And there, toward the end of May, you begin to prepare for that time called summer. And then June arrives. The days are getting longer by far. They're getting warmer And people are anticipating the joy of being outdoors and enjoying summer. Do you remember days like that? The summer wind came blowing in from across the sea. It lingered there to touch your hair and walk with me. All summer long we sang a song And then we strolled that golden sand Two sweethearts and the summer wind Like painted kites, those days and nights They went flying by was new beneath a blue umbrella sky then softer than a piper man one day it called to you I lost you I lost you to the summer wind The autumn wind and the winter winds, they have come and gone. And still the days, those lonely days, they go on and on. And guess who sighs his lullabies through nights that never The summer wind The summer wind Warm summer wind The summer wind What were some of your summertime memories? Think with me as I share a few of mine. Maybe yours are similar. Maybe yours are vastly different. I came from an area where I had access to the beach, both a bay and uh, the Atlantic Ocean on occasion, and even some lakes in upstate New York. So outdoor activities were a part of who I was from the time that school got out in June until it was time to return that Wednesday after Labor Day. I can remember when I was much younger 
it seemed when you got to around Easter, which could be March or April, depending upon the year, it seemed that summertime would never get here. It just seemed like a million years away. And when you're young, of course, your concept of time is vastly different than when you become middle age and then also as you get to this point in life when you're in your 60s and and time just seems to fly it just flies so fast away but I can remember when we got to Memorial Day in May it wouldn't be long just three four more weeks and school would let out and my brother David and I would be shipped off to our grandparents' house who lived right on the water. And we spent our summers on the beach. We learned how to swim. We learned how to sail. We learned a lot of of life skills and, and many a friendship made during that time. And to think you're going to be out of school June, July, all of August, and eventually go back to school in September. The idea of three months of being out of school was just amazing. Three months. Not quite, but in our minds, three months. And those three months, compared to the other nine months of the year, seemed to fly by so quickly. In June, we would get to our grandparents' house. We had been there probably around Memorial Day where there's a first little official opening of the the beach right adjacent to their home. And that was the first official weekend that people could really get in there and spend some time with somebody on duty to check in case anybody is bold enough to swim in that still relatively cool bay water. And then the next event was the 4th of July. And that beach had a huge party. It was a technically a private beach. A bunch of people that owned it and paid dues to be a member of it, to use it, to maintain it, to pay for the lifeguard, had this huge party on the 4th of July that started early in the morning and went till late at night. And even though fireworks in New York State were not legal, there were plenty of them around about sundown till about 10, 1030 at night. We would swim. We would be involved with races, swimming races, all kind of games and activities, plenty of hot dogs, plenty of really bad junk food all day. Even would go sailing out of Manhasset Bay. Did all those things in the summertime. What was your summertime like? We'd been there for maybe just a couple of weeks when that big party hit. And now we have all this time of July and August to enjoy this beach. August seemed to come around a little bit too soon. And you realize that September is now around the corner. And it won't be long until the summertime fun is over. But you're going to enjoy it every bit of the way. When I was older and I'd finished high school, I can remember having to work that summer. I didn't really get a chance to be at the beach. And I can remember the difference that summer was going to be. I was going to be leaving home actually never to return. Didn't think that, but it worked out that way, that I went on to schooling and struck out of my own after I finished high school. And I can remember that year that I'd worked that summer. I had worked the 4th of July. I didn't get down to the lower part of the state. I never did see the bay or the ocean that year. I finished high school and went to work at a radio station. I was working six and seven days a week, filling it for every vacation slot, putting together some money for the new life I was going to begin, believe it or not, after Labor Day. And I can remember that year, the 4th of July, working, working a double shift. I was on the air from like, oh, I don't know, I think it was like 10 in the morning till about 9 o'clock at night. 
that 4th of July, and I worked, and I watched as that summer was beginning to fade away, and I remember right after Labor Day, getting in my car, there was still a song playing on the radio that that talked about those lingering days of summer. I remember listening to it as I departed from New York State and crossed into Pennsylvania and then into Ohio. Remember this song from 1972? See the curtains hanging in the window In the evening on a Friday night Little light is shining through the window Let me know everything's all right Paper laying on the sidewalk A little music from the house next door So I walk on up to the doorstep Through the screen and across the floor Ooh. Summer breeze Makes me feel fine Going through the jazz in my mind Days of summer, the Jasmine's in bloom. July is dressed up and playing her tune. And I come home from a hard day's work, and you're waiting there. I care in the world. See the smile of rain in the kitchen, food cooking on the plates for two. Feel the arms that reach out to hold me In the evening when the day is through Summer breeze Makes me feel fine Going through the jazz in my mind Summer breeze Makes me feel fine Going through the jazz in my mind From 1972, Seals and Croft and Summer Breeze here on Truth to Ponder. Today, we're kind of celebrating Labor Day, the unofficial but semi-official end of summer for most people here in the Northern Hemisphere in the United States. Our unofficial beginning of summer comes around Memorial Day, end of end of May, Fourth of July is a major holiday. And then Labor Day kind of is the official end of the fun and vacation part of many of our summers as back in my day, school is back in session. Some places even before Labor Day, but in many parts right after. And even though though the summer doesn't give way technically until the 22nd of September in most years, We begin to think about fall and the changes in September. Now, can you remember if you were a television watcher back in the 1960s, maybe 50s and even into the 70s, when September rolled around and you're back at school, and even before the summer came to an end, the three major networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, 
were promoting their new fall lineup. You started seeing teasers about a new show coming up this fall. Be sure to view on Monday or Tuesday, whatever the night was. We were being prepared for a new school year and even a new television cycle. I can remember that back in in my day. Doesn't seem to be so much of that now because of the way television works. It's a totally different entity today than it was back then with all the competition from from things like streaming. But there was kind of a cycle to our lives. It began on the first of the year, got us through winter, got us into spring, got us into Easter, got us toward the end of spring, looking forward to summer. And then we got to that point. We got to that point in the summer as we're approaching Labor Day, the day that we celebrate today here in the United States, this 7th, this 7th of September, this first Monday in September. This has been a holiday literally since back in the 1800s, and the first parade, I think, was held on September the 5th in 1882 in New York City. A parade that almost never came off, but it happened. And, and we've been doing it ever since. And it's the unofficial, as I said before, end of our, our summertime experiences, at least in my time. A few days later, you're back at school, people's vacations were over, and you applied yourself to the beginning of a new school year and a new cycle of time and vacations as you prepare to start school but end another year as we end as we enter this last one-third of a year. Living in Long Island, even more so than living upstate, you would anticipate the fall. As a kid, I couldn't wait for fall either. I love the colors. I love the the cool air. Even though I love the summertime warmth and the beach, there was something about autumn that was always a lot of fun. In upstate New York, you felt by the end of August the beginnings of the cool weather, more so than even Long Island. Where we live in the mountains of Georgia, we get a little bit of that same experience we had upstate because we're at such a high elevation. And I can feel the beginnings of the shorter days. It's so pronounced now. And the cool evenings taking hold and the daytime highs climbing nowhere near as high you see the first leaves starting to drop but the colors are getting ready to change we're coming to the end of the cycle for our trees for this year and at about six weeks from now here in georgia the fall colors will explode here in the mountains I know that when I lived in upstate New York, those colors came by. Man, they were there in the end of September. You saw it. It was about a month ahead with much cooler nights. I can remember I can remember always getting the new school clothes right before Labor Day. My first long sleeve shirts of the year ready to go as we look forward to that time called fall September what a time September could be the transition from summer to the beginning of a new school year and also the beginning of the autumn of our year this is Truth to Ponder and I'm your host Bob Bierman
Playing songs like that bring back some of my memories of being an on-air disc jockey from way back when in the 70s, Earth, Wind and & Fire and September. September, what a time of change we have each year in September. We prepare for the long winter ahead in the Northern Hemisphere. I know it's confusing for those in the Southern Hemisphere where the weather is the opposite. You're coming out of your winter and looking forward to your spring. But here in our part of the world, summer comes to an end and we get back to our our routines and we celebrate holidays and, and days like Labor Day as part of our celebration of who we are as a people. And I wanted to take a little time to get away from the headlines of the day, the news of the day, all the angst and anger of the day, and even the misinformation of the day, just to bring some, bring back some memories of a different time. In my lifetime, and I was thinking about this as I heard that song, I can remember, I can remember the thought process of my youth. I always believed the end of the world and things that would change would be like, you know, thousands of years in the future. In spite of the fact that I had read the book, The Late Great Planet Earth, something about it just did not resonate with me as being 1984 is the end of the world or 1988, whatever. Yeah, 88. Because because Israel became a nation in 1948, a generation is 40 years, so we all will wait for Jesus in 1988. And I listened to a lot of people back in those days, especially when I got into college. I began to explore more about my faith background. And I looked at other church backgrounds and denominations and and try to get a better handle on what it was to be identifying as a child of God, a follower of Christ. And it took me a while, it took me a number of years to learn and feel at ease with where I was in, in my relationship. And I listened to a lot of, a lot of preachers that, that were trying to get it so deep into what's called eschatology, the end time things all over shortwave radio, even on many AM, FM, Christian radio stations and websites, there is a large number of people that claim to be prophets, that claim to have inside information, that claim to have some revelation that they have found and discovered by doing some mathematical formula with words in the Bible and just all kinds of nonsense trying to tell us when the end of the world is going to be. In the 1970s and into the early 1980s, you had those that really believed that the end of the world was coming in 1988. Because you had this sign, that sign, this kind of angst, this kind of anger, this kind of division. And keep your eyes on the instability in the Middle East. Over the years, I have almost, almost fallen prey to that kind of thinking. There is something about people that give you end-time prophecy that you find appealing, alluring, fascinating. And you look at the world around us and you wonder, could these be the last days? Could this be it? In the 1990s, starting about 1997-98. A lot of of people got on shortwave radio, regular radio, books were written, that the year 2000 has to be it. I mean, why not? It was 2,000 years from this to the flood, and 2,000 years from the flood to Jesus, and 2,000 years to now, and then a 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ if you go into the rapture thinking. It all made perfect sense. Got to be the year 2000. And then it got hyped up with what they considered a potential problem 
called the Y2K computer bug. And when that bug hit every computer, you're going to watch airplanes fall out of the sky. Gas pumps won't work. Your money in the bank will disappear. And you had people writing books. I mean, writing books. Selling pre-packaged food that will last for like 20 years. Got to get ready for Y2K when the power grid comes crashing down. When satellites can't control their orbit. And communications are interrupted. You remember remember all that hype? People selling generators, every kind of survivalist gear known to mankind. And a lot of people bought their 20-year food that's expired by now. I have watched too many of these individuals with their predictions and prophecies that never came true. And what I find even most annoying is how many of them are still on radio, television, the Internet, writing and selling books. I would suggest to anybody that wrote a book saying that the end of the world was 1988, I would suggest that anyone that said the judgment of God was coming in the year 2000 because, well, I have inside information because God told me so. Or made predictions that the year 2015 or 16 was going to be it. And you keep having to backtrack and reinvent yourself. Maybe it's time to take a look at yourself and recognize you are not a prophet of God. Here's what the Bible tells me. And I think back to those days in the 1970s. When people were trying to predict the end of the world and all the chaos and it's going to happen here, there, and, you know, what does the Bible say? There'd be people saying, oh, the Lord is over here. He's coming over there. Don't listen. We will see the signs of his coming. And those signs may may show up today, but he still may be well after our lifetime is over. The Bible's clear about one thing. A day of tribulation is coming. And the Bible also pretty well told us there are lots of tribulations along the way since the time of Jesus. And this is where a lot of people get caught up and get get themselves in the weeds. They believe all these terrible things are somewhere way in the future. Later this week, I have a person I'll be interviewing, hopefully for the Thursday or Friday program, not sure which. His name is John Peck, and he's actually an Orthodox priest, presbyter but a true believer in Christ. And he he has studied the world that we live in in ways to get an understanding of what it really means to be a Christian. Too many American Christians are spoiled, rotten, Christians in name only, and cultural. They look at this pandemic, and it's given them a great excuse never to go back to church because it was just too much trouble to begin with anyway. The American church has been horrifically spoiled until now for the most part for the most part you could build a church start a congregation worship as you please and there was no negatives at least from the government but I've noticed this trend that's happening that people of faith get more discriminated against on Twitter, and they the same on Facebook, and I can imagine some of these DXers that think everybody's a conspiracy theorist, you know, that here I am ranting and raving. Well, guess what? I'm not. I'm being very pragmatic here. When you look at what's happened, like in California, you can have hundreds of protesters for a George Floyd memorial but only 12 are allowed to attend an outdoor Catholic Mass. 
churches all over California are effectively still shut down, even in Nevada, but the casinos are open. Apparently, the this virus, even though it's not alive, has a has the ability to detect where it can and cannot affect. And later this week, we're going to talk more about the virus, where it came from, when it will burn out. Yeah, they all do at some point. The new mantra, as I said earlier in the program, if you were with me, expect to start hearing people talk about 400,000 will die by the end of this year because of COVID-19 in the United States. And if we simply wear a mask, it'll all go away magically. I've already shared with you some information that's been out there for the past 20 years on websites from medical schools. We're not talking some made-up website. I didn't invent the statistics. They're just simply there to read from legitimate sources. And somehow, politicians know more than physicians. I would almost begin to think, I would almost begin to think that there are some people out there that want this pandemic to continue on as long as possible. The lockdowns, as long as possible. The fear, as long as possible. There's no doubt in my mind. Look, in the 1970s, there was kind of an awakening among a lot of young people. It was called the Jesus Movement. I remember it. I was, I was very involved in it. But it left me curious more about what you can really find in Scripture, and you realize that feelings do not cut it when it comes to faith. Too many people go by their feelings, not, not really on faith. And later this week, we're going to be talking with several people. I know hopefully John Peck, uh, I believe tomorrow, I've got another individual coming on that has done a lot of reading and research. He's got his doctorate, and we'll talk about some of the things occurring today and what it may mean. I'll never tell you it does, but we're told in Scripture to look for the signs of his coming. Don't be led like sheep astray. Learn the shepherd's voice and listen to him. The key in all of this is to be wise, informed, and not panicking like so many people do. The most important thing we can do is to have that relationship with Jesus Christ to get us through these times to take away our fear and to give us hope. Because if we do that, that is the beginning of a great life regardless of the circumstances. This is Truth to Ponder, and I'm your host, Bob Bierman, from the 1970s. She went by the name Honey Tree. One of my favorite songs of that era, Clean Before My Lord. Clean before my Lord I stand, and in me not one blemish does he see. to 
does he see when I place all my burdens on him he washed them all from me where did the time go a happy labor day to you Don't forget our website, truthtoponder.com. That's the word truth, the number two, and ponder.com. Tomorrow we have a very special program and a very special guest. I hope you'll find the time to, to tune in and listen to this program. We have a week of preparation and a week of information on how we can be ready for the future that we are standing on the very precipice. This has been Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. To find out more, visit our website, truth, the number two, and the word ponder.com. That's truth, the number two, ponder.com. Truth to Ponder, shining the light of truth in a darkening world.